I would like to begin my talk today with an apology. I was looking forward to visiting Tbilisi once again this year for the Solar Forum, but unfortunately family responsibilities have intervened. However, I am committed to returning in 2024, and perhaps I may make two separate visits uh, instead of one. Nevertheless, I feel privileged to speak to you today on what I believe to be a vitally important subject. Very simply, I want to ask the question with you, can I faithfully read my Bible with integrity and at the same time be committed to promoting the freedom of religious belief? This is an especially difficult question for someone like myself, who is an evangelical Christian. I hope, however, I can offer a pathway through the difficulties and help both my evangelical and other friends. And I intend to do this by means of some reflections on the principles of biblical interpretation, or to use the technical word, hermeneutics. But first of all, let me explain the problems as I understand them. As an evangelical, I am committed to believe that the Bible is God's words, inspired by God's own spirit. And since God is truthful, I believe that I am required to affirm that every word that God has spoken reflects his own character. He cannot lie. So here's the difficulty. The Bible, especially the Old Testament, describes events of which God clearly approves, and may sometimes even command, but they read more like the actions of a jihad than those of a God committed to freedom of religious belief. Indeed, the history of so-called Christian nations is full of actions which have sought to suppress in a violent way those whose perceived religious beliefs differ from theirs. And this, of course, is true of the context of many of us at this conference today. As a keen student of family history, I've become aware that time and again, those from whom I am directly descended have engaged, engaged in rapacious acts. For example, many of my ancestors were engaged in the medieval crusades against Islam. And they used the Old Testament stories as justification. The conduct of Vladimir Putin today is, as you are well aware, laced with appeals to a Christian theology of jihad, though in his case it is against other Orthodox Christians. But assuming that I can provide an answer to this first challenge, there is a second. The Bible does not appear to speak directly to matters of the freedom of religion. How then can I argue that as a Christian I should seek to promote such freedoms on the basis of my obedience to the words of the God of the Bible? How am I to respond? Various attempts to answer the first question have been adopted down the centuries. These have sometimes involved a sharp break being placed between the Old and New Testaments. In this case, the Old Testament is viewed as a failed divine attempt to put right the mess into which humanity fell in the Garden of Eden. Only at his second attempt, it is suggested by these views, did God get it right. I cannot, however, read the Bible in this way as a conscientious evangelical, as it seriously undermines my commitment to the divine authority of the Old Testament. So how can I reply? My first answer is to say that I do not know all the answers, and even if I did, I do not have time to explore them fully here today. However, fundamental to my reply is that we need to read the Bible as a cumulative revelation. And this Cumulative revelation implies two things. First of all, it reminds us that God reveals himself in the Bible step 
by step. To make my point, I want to refer you to the well-known occasion in which Moses encountered God at the burning bush. In their conversation, God made two very important observations to Moses. He began by telling Moses in Exodus chapter 3 verse 6 that he was, and I quote, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, end quote. Then in response to Moses asking God what was his name, in verses 13 and 14 of the same chapter, God re Moses received the reply, I am. As to this name of God, Moses was given an interpretation. The Lord said, I am who I am. Christian scholars down the centuries have endlessly debated what this phrase means. However, the Hebrew grammar can help us. Implicit in the name is the thought, I will be whom I will be. In other words, Moses is told that step by step in his experience and that of others who follow him, God will fill out the picture of who he is and what he is like. Indeed, by the appeal to his ancestors, Moses is told that he can also learn a great deal about God from their experiences too. Also implied, I would suggest, is that what is revealed about God will be self-consistent. This leads to my second point. As a teacher, I know that it's simply impossible to share at once all my knowledge on a subject with any new group of students. I have to lead them gradually to the point where they can master the subject and, of course, sometimes eclipse my own knowledge. So to teach them well, I have to take them through different stages and levels of their subject. In other words, I teach cumulatively, as any good teacher would. Nothing that I teach becomes irrelevant, but each step is designed to lead to the next. Perhaps I can use an illustration from building a house. After I have completed a course, and when the subject is mastered, the perceptive student will look back and see that step by step I was first providing the foundations and then the framework before building the completed house. The Apostle Paul understood the Old Testament as functioning in this way. In Galatians chapter 3 he refers to those scriptures, that is the Old Testament scriptures, and though translations differ he describes them in verse 24 as a school teacher to lead us to Christ. For the Apostle the story of the Old Testament is filled full in the life and work of Jesus. Paul is suggesting that the Bible is the history of God's saving purposes. He is also saying that only when Jesus is seen as the end of the story can we look back and fit all the pieces together. Equally, I would say that only when we know the earlier story can we know God in all the fullness of his revelation. But that is a subject for another time. However, with this in mind, we should note that fundamental to Jesus' teaching was that his kingdom was not of this world. But in making this claim, it's clear from his own commitment to the Old Testament scriptures that he recognises that they point to him and that what scholars have called a typical relationship exists between himself and the earlier scriptures. Before we explore this further, it's important to stress that Jesus was not an innovator at this point. First of all, scholars have long recognised that Old Testament Israel's understanding of history was radically different from its neighbours. In the ancient world, history was part of an ever-recurring cycle. It is, of course, in many parts of the world still today. But for Israel, History was linear. 
It was going somewhere. Specifically, to put it in New Testament terms, it looked to the time when the kingdoms of this world would become the kingdom of God and of his Messiah. Moreover, ancient Israel, certainly at its best, understood its present experience in the light of this hope. Inevitably, then, the present experience of being God's people was seen as anticipatory of the end to which all history was headed. This self-understanding becomes explicit in the Old Testament prophets, and Jesus fully embraced it as the one in whom all would be fulfilled. However, and secondly, Jesus, as we noted above, spoke of his kingdom as not being of this world. Again, we need to tread carefully here. In the light of the Old Testament hope of a renewed cosmos, a hope that is reinforced in the New Testament, Jesus cannot have meant that there was no connection between the present world, which is the Son of God he had made, and the new creation in which his kingdom will be fully realised. Jesus is surely pointing to the fact that there was a radical, even transcendent disjunction between his kingdom and the sort of models with which contemporary secular powers operated. operated. This enables us to return to our discussion of typology. Jesus and his predecessors understood that the institutions and persons of the Old Testament were types or examples which pointed forward to his final fulfilment of all things as the antitype. Specifically, and this is very important, the land of Israel in Palestine anticipated his coming rule over the whole earth. The role of God's people was therefore to reflect the life of that age to come in both ethical lifestyles and as agents of his judgment against all rebels against him. In this regard, it's important to note that the judgments of God fell most heavily on his own people when they failed, and when those judgments fell on others, it is emphasised that this was only in the face of repeated and deliberate hostility to him and his ways. Incidentally, this last point somewhat mitigates the charge that the God of the Bible is vindictive and capricious. But for our purposes, it also undermines the idea that the role of Israel to act against non-Christians is one that a modern Christian state can adopt against so-called infidels. If we do, we're failing to compare biblical like with biblical like. The role of judge is that of Jesus on his return, and neither Pope, Patriarch or supposed Christian ruler is permitted to usurp the role and rule of Christ. In fact, and this leads us to the second question we posed ourselves at the beginning of this lecture, a careful study of Jesus's words and the teachings of his friends in the New Testament paint a very different picture. And this brings us closer to our understanding of how we should react to the claims for the freedom of religion. First of all, Jesus is insistent that he is the way, the truth and the life. We read this, of course, in the familiar passage in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 16. Jesus teaches that there is only one truth, and that is him. All other truths are lies. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was forceful and outspoken in his opposition to those who refused to recognise him uh, for who he was and is. In other words, to refer back to the theme of this conference, freedom of belief cannot mean that belief systems that fail to acknowledge Jesus are anything else than lies. Secondly, however, Jesus was not prepared to resort to those secular models that insist that opposition to him must be overcome by physical force. This was very evident in Gethsemane. There, 
as we read in Luke chapter 22, one of Jesus' disciples was quick to take up a sword to defend Jesus. We're told that he cut off the ear of one of the high priest's officials, who was himself probably armed. Jesus, however, responded in three ways. He healed the injured man. He made it clear that this was not to be the way his followers conducted themselves. And he entered into discussion with his enemies. It seems clear to me that the early church learned from this particular incident and doubtless others. Neither in the Bible nor until the fourth century is there any clear evidence that the disciples of Jesus considered violence and coercion as the way in which they were to deal with other belief systems. In addition, many of the earlier Christian writers that are known to us are designated as apologists. In other words, they sought to demonstrate the reasonableness of Christian faith. They sought to win the minds and hearts of those they addressed with words, not physical aggression. Granted all this, we might still ask the question, were they also committed to promote freedom of religious belief? This, however, may be to ask the wrong question and look for statements that reflect our setting rather than theirs. Engaging in discussions as to freedom of belief would have been largely wasted in their day. There would have been no one listening. However, two important things can be said. Firstly, the conduct of early believers towards the marginalised in society appears to have been markedly different to that of those who held to the prevailing belief systems. These disciples were therefore characterised by their commitment to those who were disadvantaged and ignored by society at large. This was irrespective of the belief system of the person or persons they were seeking to assist. In this way then, they demonstrated by their actions a respect for those who were often shunned or victimised by the prevailing secular society. There was of course little else they could do as a group who carried no power and authority to effect change, but their conduct however offered an eloquent testimony to the underlying direction of their thinking. A second point needs to be made here. Scholars have sometimes spoken of progressive revelation and have used this term to suggest there is a revelatory trajectory in Christian teaching that extends beyond the Bible. Now caution is required here. Sometimes the concept has been used to imply that if the Bible writers had lived today, they would have reached different conclusions to those they reached when they were alive. In other words, they would recognize today that they got some things wrong. I'm deeply unhappy with this argument. I prefer the suggestion that there are principles in the teaching of the Bible which, when applied to new times and circumstances, offer insight in how to the Bible in, into how the Bible applies to such changed contexts. Let, let me offer you an illustration. In 1619, a group of English Christians were living in exile in Leiden in the Netherlands. They were there because they had been persecuted for their beliefs. Among their number was a group who would become known as the Pilgrim Fathers when they emigrated to America. Before they left, John Robinson, their minister, preached a sermon. In it, he told his hearers that, quote, the Lord has yet more light to shed forth from his most holy word. His point is, I think, clear. Those of his congregation who were departing for America would find themselves in a new and a very different world, challenged by new circumstances and situations that hitherto could scarcely have been imagined. Thus, unless the Bible was seen to have had re relevance to their new situations, it would become merely a dated book to be placed on a dusty bookshelf. Robinson was, however, convinced that the new situations would reveal a new relevance to scripture.
such scriptures that had long been known. After all, Robinson believed, as I do, that the Bible is God's words. If we accept Robinson's conviction, and as I've indicated, it's one I share, we can return to the question, does the Bible promote the idea that we should be committed to freedom of religious belief? My response is most definitely. I would want to argue that this is consistent with the way Jesus lived and acted. His understanding of himself and his ministry was one that rejected the use of power to seek control as to how people think and act. Jesus used words, not the sword. Jesus was in no doubt that the time would eventually come when people would have to answer for their response to him and face the consequences of those decisions. However, for the present, persuading minds and hearts was the proper approach for him, his disciples, and I would suggest for us. But more than this, Jesus went out of his way to help the marginalised in society. This is especially apparent in Luke's Gospel, where Dr. Luke so typically regularly records stories of Jesus' dealings with children, women, and those who are outcast because of medical conditions and the like. I believe the early church understood this and applied Jesus' teaching and example to their own often quite different situations. I also believe we are called to do the same. Thus the Christian church should, as it usually has been at its best, at the forefront of initiatives to support the vulnerable and marginalised. It should also be committed to the use of words, not other forms of coercion. It should then, in faithful obedience to the Lord Jesus and his teaching, be active in recognising the freedom of individual consciences and offer respect for their expression of their own convictions. Now I am of course aware that there are limits to every freedom and modern societies have to tread a very fine line between promoting freedom while offering protection from the abuse of such freedoms in oppressing others. This is a critical issue in so-called liberal democracies like my own United Kingdom. However, addressing that question uh, would require another paper. So I conclude. My aim in this paper has been to offer a hermeneutical framework within which evangelicals and all Christians who have a high view of the authority of the Bible can operate in addressing the question of the freedom of religious belief. As I close, I want to affirm several points that I have tried to make. First of all, the trajectory of the Bible's teachings is, I have sought to argue, one in which we should recognise that obedience to Jesus means we are called to promote the freedom of religious belief. Secondly, we should in the light of the Bible's overall message oppose all forms of Christian jihad and be profoundly apologetic that the church has engaged and still does engage in what amounts to a clear denial of the gospel when it adopts such approaches. Christian jihadism, very simply put, is heresy. Finally, and above all, we should recognise, as did the early church, that Jesus is our template. He was the truth and spoke the truth boldly. He taught that the time will come when all are answerable to their response to him. However, he is the judge, not us. Moreover, at the same time, he used words to win hearts and minds, rather than violent methods to control people's lives. He and his disciples looked out for and after the marginalised, irrespective of their belief system. So, I suggest, should we?